Welcome back to The Whole Person Revolution, a podcast of Comet Magazine. I'm your host, Ann Snyder, and we are in a more narrative season seeking to tease out the texture of that incipient stage of various social movements being born, the kind of deep underground filtering of a big idea. Where our print issue this summer has taken a kind of scatterplot almanac approach to various movements of history and their more hidden beginnings, this accompanying podcast season is featuring those brave souls today who have a big idea and are seeking to give it some legs. Today, I'm with Catherine Gell, an entrepreneur and business owner who has discerned a problem at the heart of America's notoriously unhealthy politics, a problem located in the very rules of the game today. She's going to explain what she's discovered under an x-ray machine built from decades of experience competing as a businesswoman in the free market. Catherine is the former president and CEO of Gale Foods, a $250 million high-tech food manufacturing company that she sold in 2015. But I just have to say, that when I first met Catherine, something about her pragmatism, comprehensive 360 degree thinking all things through, single-minded commitment and going for broke hope gave me goosebumps. In 2020, Catherine founded the Institute for Political Innovation and published The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. You'll have to judge for yourself, of course, But I actually don't think that subtitle is hyperbolic. Something tells me Catherine may have just found a key. Catherine, welcome to the Whole Person Revolution. It's a deep honor to have you, and I'm really enlivened by the opportunity to help you flesh out this powerful idea that is actually doing something for a change about the broken politics a lot of us Americans feel forced to drink and ourselves feed. So thank you very much for being here. And it's a privilege for me. And I always need, as we all do, additional motivation, even though I probably am always going for broke on on this change. But you gave me some more motivation in your gracious introduction. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, So just right off the bat, tell us a bit about this big idea that you shared with me when we met a number of months ago that you say in this book could save democracy. What is what is the idea called and what is it? Great. So first, let me tell you what we're trying to solve for with this idea. Because there's so much talk about our broken political system and there are so many things that many people rightly believe need to be changed and be different and be improved, et cetera. So here's what we're going at. In a decade, the measure of success, the problem I'm solving for will be whether or not Congress as a legislative body and state legislatures and governors are solving problems, complex problems with huge trade-offs in a bipartisan consensus way that makes them sustainable. And that's, that's the only thing that's going to matter. So everything I'm working on now are the steps it would take us to get there. But ultimately, no matter how many interim successes we would have, which is to say wins for the particular changes we want to make in the political system, they only count for success because they're necessary steps along the way. But eventually this whole effort will be judged by everyone and by me as to whether the ultimate aim is achieved. So now we'll talk about the movement, but we're always remembering what we're actually doing it for. So final five voting is a new way to run our election system because the election system is how people in elected office get and keep their jobs and all people do what it takes to get jobs and to keep them. Politicians do what it takes to win. What it takes to win in the current system, the, like the best way to win, and sometimes the only way to win in the current system is to incent 
division and demonize the other side and profit from gridlock in Congress. And that's a good way to win. Sometimes, as I said, the only way to win. A really good way to lose is to solve a complex problem with trade-offs by voting yes on a bipartisan piece of legislation on issues like immigration or debt deficit or, or health care, et cetera, because the bipartisan consensus piece of legislation on these big issues necessarily means that neither of the two current sides would get everything they wanted. And guess what? Neither side can vote for that because they'll both lose. For example, to make it clear, if we were to aspire to fiscal sanity in our country again and stop putting everything on the credit card and, and you know, waiting for our children to pay it back if, and it won't be possible, we would need to have a negotiated package whereby we have some benefit decrease and some tax increase. And you would put those pieces together. Way back in 2000 and I think it was 2012 when Simpson Bowles came out with their report, it was this bipartisan commission on what we needed to do to have this fiscal sanity. It, it was a grand bargain, which I actually used to read David Brooks' <laughs> column all the time waiting for the grand bargain to happen. And the, on the on the front page of the of their report, it says, and I sort of paraphrase the quote, none of us agrees with everything in here, but we all agree that this combined package is better than anything we're doing now and is the best way forward that we can all agree on. And so we don't need to get everything we want to do the right thing for the country. That deal went nowhere. And it's still, it's always gonna go nowhere because nobody can vote yes on that deal and win their party primary again. The idea is that if we change how people win elections and at the same time actually make them more fair and more democratic, then we will change what our leaders have the freedom to do, what they're incented to do and on whose behalf they're doing it, which is to say, we need to make solving problems a really good way to win re-election. And how we do that is by changing the election system. It's called Final Five Voting. Final Five Voting is the umbrella name for two simple changes to our election system. The first is that we eliminate separate party primaries because they push both sides to the extremes and only 8% of people in the country participate in choosing who wins party primaries. Instead, we will have a single primary where everybody has the right to participate and the right to run regardless of their party. People vote for their favorite. And now instead of advancing just one Republican and one Democrat to the general election, the top five finishers will go forward. So now we have no idea who's won, which is not the case today. Usually after the primary, you pretty much know who's gonna win in general months before most voters even turn out. But now we don't know. You could have in a red district more than one Republican, in a blue district more than one Democrat, a green, a libertarian, an independent. And they go forward to the general election and we benefit from this dynamic, diverse debate, a competition of ideas and visions and candidacies between the primary and the general. Then in the general election, now that we have these five and we have all the benefits of competition and accountability, we need to figure out who wins. And what you don't wanna do is have one of those five kind of accidentally win with like 21% of the vote, which could happen if the vote split relatively equally five ways. You need to figure out who has the true majority. And there's an easy fix. We will use an instant runoff system in the general election. It's exactly like a series of runoff elections where you go from five candidates to four, to three, to two, and then you have the winner. But instead of voters having to keep coming back physically for another election, they simply cast all their votes at once using a ranked ballot. 
and then the results can be calculated instantly. You'll, it will be clear to everybody who the final two are and the person from that final two will be the, the candidate with the true majority. So now they've won, they go to Congress. And again, let me say final five voting may change who wins elections. It'll probably change who runs those kind of things, but it's not required that final five voting change who wins. That's not the point of it. It's designed to change what winners do and on whose behalf they're doing it. So now they will be, they will have the freedom to work together across the aisle because that's what general election voters want. They will have the freedom to deal with trade-offs because general election voters are open to those kind of deals. And they will be incented to work on behalf of general election voters, which include everyone in their district, not just their narrow slice of partisans. So they have a lot more agency and leadership and deal-making opportunity available to them. And finally, there'll be true accountability because if they don't get things done that are pleasing a majority of their district, they'll be guaranteed new competition, uh, you know, healthy, robust competition in their next election. And that is the entire idea. Sometimes I call it free market politics. It really brings the best of what competition brings to any human endeavor, which is innovation results and accountability. It's just so refreshing, first of all, to hear a constructive response. Literally everybody I know describes American politics as broken, dysfunctional, or worse. <laughs> um, and there's so much hemming and hawing, and there's various diagnoses. And I, most people on this podcast will know I am much more a cultural thinker than a nuts and bolts thinker. I wish I had more nuts and bolts in my brain. Um, but I think hearing this, and I'm always attracted to these very concrete um, shifts often that have like a genius weirdly around math and numbers and sequence that actually can wind up changing whole systemic norms. Um, and I just, there's something in what you're, in what you're proposing that is, it feels fresh. It's, it's not the sort of, oh, we need to solve money in politics, or we need to solve term limits, or we need to solve, um, some sort of gerrymandering, you know, like all, I feel like there's sort of a range of pathologies or, or things that people name as the menu of this is why we're, you know, this is why things are, are working so poorly and the public feels so utterly dissatisfied, but this aha of like bringing a bit more of sort of, um, kind of free, free market standards and logic into the game, into a space that we tend to probably over-spiritualize and hyper-exalt the political arena. I mean, on the one hand, we condemn it for being so dysfunctional. At the same time, I think we, we increasingly think of it almost like a religion where you can't bring these more enterprising mental modules in. I just, I, I, th th that's all like why I respond. Yeah, there's a dogma. Yes, there is a dogma. But let me, if I could, and respond to what you're saying that you are, you know, often think from the cultural perspective. Here's, here's what I would say about that. Yes, there's many diagnoses about what is wrong and many of them are correct. We're in a very dysfunctional system, like a, Lee Drutman calls it a doom loop. So lots of things are problematic. The question is, where can we, and which is to say that if certain things in that doom loop, like the cultural aspects of this were disrupted and quote fixed, then it would have a, have a beneficial effect on the whole doom loop and make the system better. But what we have to ask ourselves is not just what is part of the cause, but which part of this cause do we have the lever to affect? Where can we intervene in the doom loop? where it's in our power to do that. So there's no way to, like something that would be really powerful is if there were a source of news that everybody believed was the truth. <laughs> what would that be like? <laughs> yeah, that'd be super, that'd be super yeah. powerful. But tell me how we would ever get it. So I don't, as a business person, that's one thing coming to this, I'm blown away by the amount of time spent discussing causes that we have no agency to fix. Right. Like, really? So what I say 
is what I write about all the time is this Venn diagram of the intersection of something being powerful, which is to say likely to change the likelihood that Congress solves results in the public interest. And then second, it has to be achievable. Like I haven't could have found something that's a pipe dream. So no constitutional amendments need apply. Um, and things like let's make the media you know, be better itself or have people think it's better, et cetera. There's no way to do that. So I'm only interested in things that are both powerful and achievable. And it turns out that the single most powerful thing I do believe is changing the incentives for our elected officials. And it also happens to be incredibly relatively achievable. It's, there's nothing at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy, but we definitely have the sweet spot of powerful and achievable. But the, but something else I want to note is, yes, this is focused on the political system. But again, if we think of the of this doom loop, if some of the reasons why our cultural and community spheres are increasingly divided is because that big structure in our lives, that organizing structure, which is our political dialogue, and, and the whole institution is so binary. And so we have to work so hard to be not binary in our families and communities, given how much we are sorted into that, how much every, every influence in the larger sphere is now binary. So by changing to final five voting, it can, start to address the pernicious negative effect that this binary, this us versus them dynamic in politics has on other social change movements and on life, daily life in communities and in families, et cetera. So we shouldn't, I mean, I'm not promising that to everybody. You know, I'm just, if, if it's enough for people to say this will be more fair, great. But I predict very deep, and ripple effect, but still, but not small ripples effect once you get rid of something so poisonous that's in the center. Exactly. Most of us are so impacted by environment and inherited paradigms, in this case, in a political context where it feels like politics has become so moral, like, and there's the bad guys and the good guys, and it is all, it's only binaries, even though I think still a very quiet but huge majority um, don't actually think in those terms, but they feel forced to think and speak in those terms and get reactive as they feel sort of pressed against a wall. And they have to live in a world that is organized that way, which has a negative effect on them, even if they're not thinking in those terms personally. Exactly. Like it's just immediately sort of draws out all of our kind of worst or weakest angels. I want to tap into this question of kind of like individual agency. As you've thought about this, let's pretend come this, this is a dream, but let's pretend 2024, like final five voting, like somehow between now and then sweeps the nation, it gets instituted. It's the way we do that election or 2028. How would you describe the bigger mental shifts that American voters would need to make to sort of adjust to ranking? Are there actual shifts in our own maturity levels that would have to occur for this to work? You know, there, there aren't, which is to say that this system of competition is something that we live with in America every day and choices. And we know instinctively how to rank anything we want, which is okay, um, you know, my husband, uh, you're going to the store, or you're going to get ice cream. Well, I want Rocky Road, but if they can't, if I can't have Rocky Road, I'll take chocolate. But if I can't have chocolate, I'll take vanilla. And if not that, you know, strawberry, but under no uncertain terms, do you get me that crazy Neapolitan? <laughs> like, I hate that. You know, people do not have any problem with deciding what they like the best to what they can't stand. So that actual decision is not complicated for people and Australians and the Irish have been voting this way for over a hundred years. Now there are cities and municipalities in the United States, but also in Alaska where we already have final five voting, 
where people did this quite successfully on their first try, which is to say that in Alaska, where they used final five, vote, final five style voting for the first time in 2024, you know, over 83% of people describe their experience as simple or very simple, and that's just one time. So there's no state that has voters less capable than the Irish, the Australians, or the, or the Alaskans. So I'm confident about that. Here's what I'll tell you. Um, the, the shifts, again, it's all where do you change the dynamic? Do you try to get people to change how they are interacting with and have a mental shift about the political system in order to change the political system? Or do you just change the system of incentives and then they change as a result of what they see in front of them. And this theoretically is the, is the latter, which is now that they have choices, they will engage with the choices. But if we try to go in and say to people, oh, we want you to start thinking about various choices you could have, like we can't have that dialogue with people at scale and change their models at scale to some theoretical thing that nobody can even imagine because they've never lived it. So the so when I think about this social change and this in particular final five voting, there's a very specific path. I actually have a whole I have a diagram, the theory of change for final five voting. And there's a very specific path and there's a very specific order of change that you have to follow, I believe. This is my this is my whole graft theory. And it's very different from other movements. It's very different because what we're trying to change is a different animal than what most people think of um, as a traditional social movement change. Are you able to describe it in words, even though listeners can't visualize it? Yeah, well, in a, I, I certainly can. Here's what I have some principles that we follow in our organization that are that it wasn't that we sat down and said, let's do principles. They are the ones that have arisen over time. The best way for principles to be articulated. Yeah, we constantly go back to them to explain the decision, not to explain, but to guide the decisions we're making. It will always be, we're doing this because as always, strategies about choosing what not to do, which is one of the ones we have. But talking about, about the one that relates to how do you change, how would we get Final Five voting um, implemented? The first, the key thing about that is we have to be fully present to things how they actually are, to the way the world works, not the way we think it should work. And we have to design our strategy to work how it works which is to say that there is not a path to final five voting that starts as a grassroots movement because the levers of change are not available to the grassroots movement on their own. And the powerful opposition is easily created by grass tops on their own. This is actually something which is good for all for grass tops, grassroots, existing politicians, future politicians. It's not, there's not many losers in this because there's there will still be a politics industry. People will still win elections, policy will still get made. You know, they'll just they'll just win by solving problems instead of win by demonizing, right? So who's that bad for? There are still all those jobs, you can win them. But point being, so we needed to think about who we go to and when so that we can be successful at passing Final Five voting. And Final Five voting gets passed state by state because the Constitution in Article One gives each state to power to make these rules for their elections. And in some states, you can do ballot initiatives, so people have to vote for it. And in other states, you can't do that. So the legislature has to pass it and the governor has to sign that bill. This is a really complex thing. So it's not like having a ballot initiative for, yes, we want to raise our property tax or no, we don't. 
this is a ballot initiative to change an election system. I mean, it's not really that complicated, but people certainly think it is, okay? And it is totally different. And there, the people who are most engaged in the politics industry, which is to say their livelihoods depend on it and they work in it all the time, there's no commercial you can run that's going to have them think this is a good idea. And the people who feel passionately that given the duopoly that we have, that one side is so much better than the other, that it's an existential crisis. And you can imagine why people feel that way on both sides, in a sense, you know that exists. They're not gonna wanna change this if it means it's more likely that the other side of the duopoly somehow runs away with it. Like, is this a Trojan horse? Which means that unless people who are in those positions of leadership and power in the existing industry see a way forward for themselves in this industry, they're, they'll just organize all the opposition and you'll get crushed. So do we like that that's the case? Do we like that there are certain people who have, you know, sort of this veto power over this change? I mean, maybe not, but they do. And that's me being super present with reality. And for that, you have to have conversations. This originally is very much a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a one to small group conversation, because people need to do diligence it. And actually, I would argue that we are benefited by people who are deeply concerned about whether we might screw something up to do diligence this idea and make sure it passes muster. And people, if you start, like if you started a whole movement and you were huge and loud about it and it was like coming soon to your state, and then you went to someone and said, oh, we just wanna check in with you if you like it or not. It's already like coming at them. That makes people be a no. That's just how it works. You know, so these are conversations you have early and you have to have the patience to have them and they're bespoke conversations and dialogues. And while you're having them, we also learn a lot of things so that we improve the idea because we also have a benefit to have people continue looking for unintended consequences, et cetera. So my point is coming back to the whole diagram, we have at the middle is success, like that the law is passed and in the circle way outside. So you have to put pressure. It's all about where does the pressure come so that in the end, the law is passed. The large outside circle is the context of overall dysfunction, which is to say, even though we hate that things are getting worse, it actually puts more pressure on a solution. And the context of increasing national support and dialogue about political innovation itself, that maybe the rules of the game do have to change, even though some people think the rules that have to change are money or gerrymandering, and they don't know it's final five voting. So that pushes in, that puts pressure on. And then in the center, there is a square, and inside the square is success, but on the, uh, on the four sides are grass tops on the top, grass roots on the bottom, political leadership on the left and opinion leadership, influence, media, academics, um, influencers on the right. And candidly, if, if you miss one of those sides, you won't get this done. So you could build, just imagine you could get, like we started in Wisconsin and I drew this diagram and made this plan originally relative to getting legislation passed in Wisconsin. You could get 80% of people in Wisconsin to, you know, say in a poll that they hope we do this. And what would we get from that? Kind of nothing. So we're clear with reality and uh, we do it in a way that is respectful to everybody who deserves a voice in this process. So, and, and absolutely everybody is involved. It's also something that should never be done and, and wouldn't be done just because grass tops decide they want to change it. That's not going to happen. And, and let me say something else. I do think that there is some moral judgment on this effort sometimes because we're not building it as first a massive grassroots effort. And I just, I reject 
that moral judgment that there's only one right way to bring about social change that is for everybody. And I reject that in favor of basically this ruthless practicality that says in order to be for everybody, we need to make really rational and strategic choices about how to get this done as soon as possible. The final thing to note, though, is we only have to pass final five voting in three states to start to make a huge difference because you pass it in three states, so state governments are changed entirely and you see how they're getting different results, which we see already in Alaska. And then you have six senators from three states. You have, you know, 20 representatives who are now the same people, but they're not beholden to the tyranny of the party primary and they can act differently because they answer to the general electorate. And they will still, by the way, this is nothing about giving up ideology. I believe you should have strong competition of ideas and new ideas in the system all the time. We don't want squishy moderates like just split the difference, but what we want is to have this competition of intense and passionate debate on ideas but then have the legislatures be able to reach agreement on a piece of legislation that is the consensus of where we can go now as a country. Yeah, this is why I love it. <laughs> it's it's getting to the nub of it all um, and sort of the architecture of it all. Um, and that sort of ruthless pragmatism and ruthless confrontation with reality as it is, um, is just shockingly rare and very refreshing. So thank you for modeling that. You've alluded to this here and there already, but I, I want to talk a bit about encouragement and discouragement. I mean, this is, I do view this as an act of political entrepreneurship and uh, vision uh, and problem solving all at once. So many things happen in sort of the early stage of a big idea, building support, creating awareness, educating, but one piece is sort of how you explain and, and trumpet it. How do you articulate this in a way that's clear to people that actually gets them intrigued? What have you found to characterize the disposition of those who tend to dismiss this, this idea? And what characterizes those who, if not immediately, like fairly quickly grasp onto it and really want to help you make it a reality? Let me say that I really understand the lived legitimacy of why many people would not be open to this idea in any way at first glance. And I don't think it's wrong that they aren't. There's so many ideas coming at us all the time. We are evolved to make quick decisions about them. Just because this is a, what I believe is, is the right idea doesn't like right doesn't make reality. And it doesn't mean that people aren't good people if they don't see that. That's my job. It's not their job. You know, so I put that pressure on us and it's natural that many people aren't listening. And then when you're fine with that, it's a legitimacy, you know, to them and to their, where they're at and what they've lived and what they've lived is this system forever. I mean, people don't think it's possible to change. One of my friends actually told me she thought Democrats and Republicans were in the constitution. And I mean, you know, our system seems permanent and immutable. Okay. Put that beside though. So the people who love it right away are business people because the whole theory is and the breakthrough is comes from all of my years in business, comes from not being in political science, for example. I did have some government experience, but most I'm in business. And so I originally only designed and wrote the book and all of that to bring business people into this conversation because I thought that they were MIA because I thought and not because they didn't care, but because they didn't see how they could make a difference in what they viewed as a just massively irrational industry. 
And I wanted to say, no, it's all the same incentives. It's everything works in politics as works here. So they, they like it immediately. They don't necessarily want to help immediately because they still have hard time believing that we can make this happen. You know, and they don't, nobody wants to waste their time. Right. But they're certainly where the initial support comes from. Then the, the initial, the people initially who don't like it, are, it's just totally natural that they don't like, it makes sense to me. It's not that they're not incented to change or not willing that they don't want a better system. Well, I should say, I am in a debate with others where some people would say people in this politics industry are bad people in a bad system. And I remain and I will always intentionally remain, even though it's totally natural right now, in the, these are good people in a bad system. So they are doing what they're incented to do, and it's totally rational, and everybody else does that too. And a bad system will defeat a good person anytime. For sure. And for us, for anyone to be so moral about the fabulous decisions they would make if they were in you know, Congress, or why don't they just do the right thing? I think it's unfair. So what we have here is a system where people who care deeply about ideas or policies or ideologies or care deeply about their own careers, et cetera, those things can all be enhanced by this unless you really are some person with an autocratic zero sum, I don't care if this is democracy as long as I get my way, well, this will be super democratic, you know? Um, so, but for everybody else, it's quite good. And so when you meet people where they're at and you're willing to see that their questions and concerns are legitimate based on whatever they've lived or understood till now, they do end up, you can get them to neutral usually. So especially if you go to them early, and this is what, this is one of the things I do differently in this organization than what I think many nonprofits do. We go first and most to spend time with people who think they don't like it. So we don't go to the easy yeses just so then we can raise money from them, for example, or so we can say we got this many people, because candidly, if we got all the easy yeses, they would make it harder to get the no's because the easy yeses would be partisan based on, you know, you would have resonance with one side and then you wouldn't, that would make it less likely you ever get the harder no's, but we do everything bipartisan. So we go first to people who don't like us and most to people who don't like us and we try to get them to neutral. And then sometimes they turn into supporters. Um, and that's just, the necessary piece again to the strategy of how you would actually make this pass. And that's an incentive that a lot of not-for-profits have, which is to go for only talking to people who already agree with you. And that really hurts making your issues successful long-term. You can bring together a bipartisan coalition. We've had a bipartisan coalition on this in Wisconsin since 2017, when we founded the effort in a bipartisan way. And we last year in 22 there were about 400 over 400 elections related bills in state legislatures around the country and i certainly have not been able to confirm this but uh, we think and i would put you know a small amount of money on that ours may have been the only bipartisan piece of election legislation that was trying to change you know these kind of rules and it was totally bipartisan. Wow. And by the way, our donors, like in Nevada, the second state we passed Final Five voting in, we had some of our largest donors who were, who were and continue to be huge players, huge donors to s different sides of the political duopoly. They were both or in more than one of them were investing on opposite sides of the candidate races in Nevada. 
but they were investing on the same side of, but it could be way better than this. The system is not good about it. So even people that people think are super partisan, which is to say that they've decided, well, there is only a duopoly and the, in, the impacts of who's in charge are too important for me to sit out because I don't really like either of them or because I wish we had something better. I live in reality, I, this potential donor, live in reality. And so I choose X side of this two choice dynamic. That doesn't mean they wouldn't like to have more and different choices because the idea of competition is that it will push us to have to have options that are that are sort of meeting what the customer wants. I, I didn't say this earlier, but I probably should. Um, I am not someone who thinks there's a problem with two parties. I have zero problem with that. Our problem is not that we have two parties and it's not the Republicans, it's not the Democrat, it's not parties. I'm in favor of strong parties. It's not that we have two. It's that the current two are guaranteed to be the only two ongoingly, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of the country. All we need is the threat of new competition. And then the existing parties will either, you know, adjust and start solving problems or they will be replaced by someone who can get into the industry. But innovation comes from having low barriers to entry into a marketplace, even if the winners in the marketplace are still, um, you know, a small number of companies. I love this notion of, um, kind of stretching people, you're stretching them to see that, that, that their security cannot lie in political tribe, uh, that like ben, there is a deeper foundation beneath that, that if it crumbles, the whole thing falls apart. And you're sort of stretching people into what I would call human maturity to look at the container for it all and invest in that. It's sort of, it feels like frankly, becoming an adult, like adolescence becoming an adult, <laughs> I think it requires a level of risk um, that people may be uncomfortable with, but it just feels like wisdom. Yeah, there, there is a risk, uh, I think, but there are definitely people who will take that risk and that I don't stretch them for it. You know, there are just so many people whose motivations are hidden in the existing duopoly. And you think their motivations are different than there are. So I don't go to the, I don't, I've had, I would say zero success in if there is a zero sum person out there, I haven't changed any of those people. So I'm not changing them. I'm showing them that there is something powerful and achievable that they would value. And then they say, yes. Yes. I'm learning as I go, even in running comment in this podcast, that so much of what I'm trying to do in a way I couldn't have articulated a few years ago, but is to sort of play a role in pivoting what often feels like increasingly an anxiety filled people into a yearning filled people, like how do you convert anxiety into yearning. And I was going to ask you if you, how are you appealing to people's, are you sort of painting a vision of what could be and giving them a little bit of that sense of the ripple effects of this new system? Yeah, I, th I think that I would take my Venn diagram with three circles and I would say that it's their existing motivations and talent and patriotism and love of country. So I don't change any of that, but if that is there and they love the country and they're engaged and, and they just are, they deeply care about it, that's great. And the way they've expressed their caring so far is to play the best they can play in this system as is. And then we show them it's our job to show why Final Five voting is powerful, that it would change the system, you know, in a way that would be beneficial and would not unduly harm them and that the different way that we would make decisions would be valuable. And then the last circle is that you show, you have to show it's not a partisan Trojan horse that would accrue to the benefit 
of one side of the existing duopoly and that essentially you'd have the same duopoly, but just with another side more set to win. So you have to show why it doesn't do that. And that may be the short term. But what they're saying is even though they love the country and they see how this could be in the long run, they also can't think that in the short term that it's some, you know, partisan Trojan horse. And it's, and it's right for people to ask that question. The good news is it isn't. It's actually um, a competitive advantage for the parties and states and, and side that would embrace it first, actually. That's another story. So you do those three things and, and it happens. You get that support. And by the way, you only, you only need so much support. I mean, I'm sure you talk about that on here and what it was, it was Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth who found like even in the nonviolent resistance movements about how, you know, three, I think it's three to 5% of people get engaged and then eventually it happens. And we can't say those statistics are exactly the ones here, but the point is the number of, of people that can make this change possible is not an unattainable number. Yeah. And especially because three states changes things already. And candidly, even one. I mean, Alaska's got a bipartisan governing coalition in their Senate and a slightly less functional one in the House. But they already are governing differently because of this. They're Democratic incumbent and a representative and their Republican incumbent senator cross endorsed each other in last November's elections, even though there were people of their own parties running in those races. The woman, the Democrat who won and went to replace a long serving Republican congressman went to DC and kept that Republican's chief of staff. And that Republican chief of staff agreed to stay and work for a Democrat. I think we can all know that that means it's not business as usual there. She did the right thing for the state because he knows all about Congress, which she didn't, and all about Alaska. Whereas if she had said, I need to get a Democratic chief of staff, she'd have a Democratic chief of staff who didn't know something about Alaska. So there's a real different dynamic. People act differently. It's pretty exciting. Yes, it's amazing. Yeah. Your word lever, like what are the levers to like totally ship norms and behavior? This is just a like perfect example um, and a very hopeful one and a very live one. Which gets that strategy being about choosing what not to do. You don't keep putting money into things that aren't powerful and achievable once you're clear. I've been wrong more than I've been right in this space, which is to say I used to think it was gerrymandering. I used to think it was just opening primaries. I used to think years ago that it was term limits. I used to think a lot of things, and other than the term limits, because I was too young to really be raising money, I raised money and invested my own money in all of those things. And eventually, through the theory and also the laboratories of democracy, it became clear that I had been wrong. I don't mean, I mean, they weren't even my ideas, but my point is, I was wrong. And I, I got people to spend money in things that aren't going to be powerful and achievable. And then I say, oh, I was wrong. And and eventually came to final five voting. And what I say all the time is, if it turns out there's some better way to, to get to Congress delivering results in the public interest in a bipartisan consensus sustainable way, well, I will trade up in a heartbeat. And if someone else has invented the different thing, that's fine. It doesn't have to be my idea and doesn't at all. And I will trade up. And that is, um, that's really a necessary piece of, of what we're doing here. What keeps you going? Like I'm hearing the strength and enthusiasm and conviction in your voice today, but I can't imagine that every day feels like. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I kind of alluded to it at the beginning when I thanked you for your introduction, because there was, a, you know, some encouragement in there and some motivation in there from your own resonance with this idea. And, and I appreciated that. And it buoys me. I will note first that one of the biggest challenges of doing this work is that I had to become very early on clear that I had to leave behind my need to be liked. 
Whereas in many of the other things I've done in my career, I didn't have to leave that behind. It might've been helpful. And I'm not saying by the way that everybody did like me, but I definitely was trying all the time. And in this case, because there's so much competing agendas that I have to say what is so, and some people don't like that. And I had to stop, I had to, and that would control, that would constrain what I was comfortable saying and doing and who I was comfortable working with, et cetera. And, and now I just say at the cost of being approved of or popular or something, I have to do what this work calls for. And as a result, sometimes it can feel lonely. And so what I use, you know, what I rely on is first, it's just the overall guiding principle. And it is a desperation almost, which is that when I figured out this new rubric to look at this new lens, to look at the problem of politics, to look at it through the competition lens and politics industry theory. And then, but that, that was interesting, but I, it was only when I found a solution to it that I became this driven, like I didn't need to spend my time to popularize this look at politics that explains the root causes and people go, Oh, that's so interesting. I never thought of that before. Isn't that great? I will buy your book. I don't care. It was when that analysis became the key driver of figuring out what we needed to change, which is the rules of the game of our elections and the, and the way to do that. And so I felt, I describe it as I couldn't unsee what I had seen. And because it wasn't popular and other people didn't see it that way, there was a lot of sort of, no, that's not the case, then I had to dedicate myself to that. And there is something motivational in that, in that struggle itself. Doing something hard, but worthwhile, is it keeps you going because, because it's hard in some ways. And and add that to the, how worthwhile it is, which it may sound too much like a politician to say that I do this for my kids, but I'll give you the sort of anecdote about that. My son, who was a newborn when I finished writing the first uh, piece I published with Harvard Business School, I finished writing it with him, like sleeping on my lap. Oh my goodness. And he, uh, when he first got COVID, the first time he had had COVID, the first time I had had COVID, we were quarantined together in the spring of 21. So that was 10 days of all mama. Like he was sort of pro COVID at that point. <laughs> no nannies, <laughs> no sister, just us. But I let him watch a lot of movies, right? Cause I was also trying to do some work and he was watching Schoolhouse Rock, which we all, well, at least I did. I don't know. You might be too young, Anne, but grew up with and, and, you know, it's just a bill on Capitol Hill. And I, COVID makes you a little existential in this, you know, odd quarantined weeks. And I thought, oh my God, when I was that age and watching that, I thought then, and, you know, throughout all my next years, that how, how lucky I was to have been born in America and that democracy and our American way of life was a gift that I was given and it was tied up in a big red bow and it was, and democracy was ascendant the world over and that I was just, you know, the lucky inheritor of that. And I realize now, and I was looking at my son, like, I cannot give him this democracy tied up in a big red bow. And I was probably wrong about that way back then. I mean, clearly I was, but I can't even tell him that's the case. My 17 year old daughter feels it in her daily life. She worries about it in a way that I didn't need to, didn't think I needed to. And this is a gift that I 
I want to give to them, the only change I want to make is to tell them that they have to, that it's a gift I'm giving, but now it's their responsibility. It's not the gift that keeps on giving unless they hold it and treasure it and retie that bow in their whole lives. But it's still my generation. So I have to do it anything I can. And this is a game worth losing, like, which is if I'm not successful, we in this movement, you know, okay, but it will be um, sort of that Teddy Roosevelt, you know, that you were in the arena on it. And actually that is who my son is named after. I was writing a commencement address addressing this work and also what things one would say to a commencement audience. And I was reflecting on Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena speech. And that is when a friend of mine said, oh, you could name him that. And so I did. Goosebumps again, Catherine. <laughs> you are an inspiration. Thank you. And thank you for the full story right there. Um, count me a friend and a and a champion of what you're trying to do. And, um, and thank you for the hope, for offering some living hope in a national context and a particular historical juncture. Um, just very grateful. I am so grateful too. Thanks for listening to The Whole Person Revolution, a podcast of Comet Magazine. Our overarching mission is to foster an imagination for a thriving society. We publish pieces by cultural luminaries and pioneering practitioners. We equip and convene leaders through forums, dinners, and symposia. We produce this podcast and a still feistier one about the evolving relationship between religion and democracy called Zealots at the Gate. And we are stewarding a budding institutional ecosystem animated by the Christian humanist tradition known as Breaking Ground. Comment readers are society's weavers, those community shepherds laboring to hold our social fabric together. And our job in all that we do is to help them help you rehumanize the age equipping you with frameworks, stories, and exemplars to sustain your vocational joy, refresh your vision, and connect you with one another to effect real cultural change. Consider joining us. You can write, you can read, you can host a Comet Supper in your neighborhood or attend one of our webinars with an author and your fellow readers. We want to equip you to be an agent of renewal in our time and we need to learn from you. Write to us at podcasts at comet.org and expect a substantive exchange. We're honored to have you within our orbit and to pilgrim together toward wholeness in a world splintering against it. The Whole Person Revolution is hosted by Comet, edited by Becca Bruder, produced and with original music by Ali Crummy, audience strategy by Matt Crummy. I'm Ann Snyder, and I'll see you next week.